All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. First off, I just want to say I've had a wonderful time here, and I think if everyone else has too. It's been great, and uh, the fellowship has been fantastic. I've been told I am... I managed to cut off my message yesterday at almost exactly an hour, despite the fact that I had no timepiece with me. <laughs> so, um, I'm trying to keep going to try to get this in 45 minutes. But what I want to do today is build off of what I presented yesterday. The idea being that we are of the kingdom of heaven, which is far above and exceeding any of the kingdoms of the earth. And so, I've been asked by multiple people, okay, so we're of another kingdom. We're no longer... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Alex, you were going to read the opening text. Um, I'll have to do it. I'll get you next time. All right? Next conference. Um, what I want to, what I want to uh, present to you is uh, something that we can do as a people if we are of the kingdom of heaven, if we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom rather than of the kingdoms of the earth. First of all, how many here like history? Pfft, nerds. Uh, we're going to do some history today. <laughs> and here's another question. How many of you would love to sock it to Babylon? What if I told you we all have that power right here, right now? We can start today. All right. Let's take a look at Ephesians real quick. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. I'll probably be moving along fairly quickly here. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. We see this constant theme throughout this passage we just read about a house. The word household, we are of God's household at the end of verse 19. We all have a role in God's house. We all have a role as being part of the family of Christ. But what do we do? What can we do? We aren't all preachers. We aren't all teachers. We all have different skills, and that's okay. Our hands, our feet, there's the heart, there's the liver. We all have different roles. But I want to present one major thing that we can all commit to today, which is effective. There's a biblical precedent and a historical precedent which I propose to present to you. Not only will this weaken Babylon, but it will strengthen the kingdom and contribute to the unity that we all came here to discuss this weekend. First of all, that word household, that is part of the word, where we find that word, oikos, in the word economy. The word economy comes from the word oikonomia, which literally means house rules. The rules of the house. So everybody's got rules and house rules at their house, right? You know, say please, say thank you, make your bed when you get up in the morning, take your shoes off at the door, replace the toilet paper, make sure the roll is facing away from the wall or mom's going to kill you, that sort of thing. But the head of the household, the head of the household is called the kurias. He was the Lord. He was the master. And throughout the New Testament Greek manuscripts, we see him referred to as kurias, where we see the word Lord. It's kurias. And that literally means the master, the head of the household. 
And as God's household, we look to him as our kurias, our Lord. The wife of Christ, or the bride of Christ, Israel, calls him Lord. We're told that Sarah called Abraham Lord. His house, his rules. If we are to have that Sarah-type attitude toward our Lord and Master, then we follow his rules, his economy. The word economy referred to the management of resources, the management of people, the management of time, all those resources that made the house tick. And we have all those things at our disposal right now in the lives that we live at this time. You know, whose house rules we live by determines in whose household we live. Do we live by the household rules of God or by the household rules of Babylon? See, we're really eager to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, to recognize Him as our Savior and praise Him for being our Savior. But when it comes down to Him being our Lord, suddenly we're not so enthusiastic. Oh, yeah, well, you know, that's all Old Testament stuff. That was done away at the cross. Right? We come up with all our excuses. Well, here's the, here's the bottom line of that. Either here's, he's both our Lord and our Savior, or he's neither. If we want to recognize him as our Savior, if we want him to truly be our Savior, then we have to meet him halfway and recognize him as our Lord. It's a two-way street. Different governments, different gods means different laws. It means different rules, different economies. You have biblical economics, where you have debts being forgiven every seven years, slaves being set free, no interest charged to your brother, honest money, honest currency, honest weights and measures. Then you have Babylonian economics. I don't have to go into the details of that. We're living it. When I was a kid, there was a family we knew. I was horrified at the way they conducted themselves at the dinner table. It was awful, in my opinion. My mother had very strict rules. You chewed with your mouth closed. You kept your elbows off the table. You held your fork a certain way. And I remember going to somebody else's house and being absolutely appalled at how their children conducted themselves. And I said, I finally broke down and I said, that's really bad manners. I remember their little girl was, I, I must have been probably about seven years old. Their little girl who was about the same age as me was sitting next to me. She's sawing at her food, her elbows right in my face. I said, that's bad manners. She looks at me and she says, we have different manners. Can't argue with that. <laughs> well, we live in the kingdom of heaven. We have been elevated to sit in the heavenly places with Christ. We live by specific house rules. Babylon has its own house rules. Render unto Caesar what is God's. Render unto Uncle Sam what he says is his. Don't say anything against sodomites. Be ashamed of your race if you aren't a minority. Pay your fees, buy your licenses, and so on and so on. That's their house rules. Well, we have different manners, do we not? You see, economy and government exist hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And the heavenly kingdom in which we live has a heavenly economy. It is in opposition to the biblical economy. Without economy, there is no government and vice versa. The economy by which we live determines under which government we live. See, without resources and people to manage, a government dies. It has nothing to live on. There's no lifeblood going on. Government is all about economy. It's all about house rules. It's about management of resources and monitoring and managing the interaction of people within that economic context. So if we claim to be part of a kingdom economy, we cannot recognize as legitimate, we cannot bow to first and foremost the rules of Babylonian economy. This is simple stuff. 
We don't accept their rules, therefore we don't accept their emissaries and their ambassadors. Kevin was talking about that yesterday. We don't want that stuff. Get out of here with it. In Acts 5, the apostles took a very, very strong stand on this. They knew under which economy, which governmental system they lived, and they weren't afraid to say it. Acts 5, verse 29, they're brought before the Sanhedrin, and what do they say? The Sanhedrin says, you better shut up. Better stop talking this stuff. You're going to get in trouble. Threatened them. And what do they say? We ought to obey God rather than men. Right to their faces. We're of a different economy. You are the emissary of Babylon. We are the emissaries of another kingdom. You want to fight? Bring it on. My king can beat up your king any day. Second John. Chapter 1. If anybody finds chapter 2, I will give them a cookie. Verse 9. Anyone who transgresses and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Verse 10. Pay attention to this. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. What do we do with the emissaries and ambassadors of Babylon? Get out. We don't want you. We don't want your garbage. Take it somewhere else. Most of you are probably familiar, since you're all history nerds, of the Battle of Thermopylae. King Leonidas, the Spartan, versus Xerxes of Persia. Those of you who saw the movie that came out years ago, you remember Gerard Butler playing King Leonidas. This is Sparta! Kicks the guy down the well, right? The ambassador of Xerxes. Well, it was an inaccurate depiction. I thought the real story was much cooler. You see, the Spartans were known to have a great deal of wit. And I could go into several of them because I love Spartan wit. But here's one case which I thought was particularly fun and a little dark. You see, Xerxes, when he came into a country and he wanted them to surrender, he said, send me a jar of water and a jar of earth. That was their way of demonstrating that their land and their resources were his. They were surrendering and giving it to him. And so the ambassador shows up in Sparta, goes up to King Leonidas and says, Xerxes says he wants a jar of earth and a jar of water to show that you submit to him. And Leonidas says, oh, I know where you can find plenty of that. Chucked him down a well. <laughs> oh, that was great. <laughs> But see, we should have that same attitude toward the emissaries of Babylon, should we not? This is the New Jerusalem. Amen? The servants of a household don't let another man, another master from another household come in and tell them how to do things. We don't let another king from another economy come in and tell us how to do things. Our master gave us the rules. He told us how to do business until he came. And so are we going to let some Tom, Dick, or Harry come in and tell us how to do things differently? To sucker us into his programs. Because I guarantee you, someone coming in from the outside into someone else's household does not have that household's interests at heart. He wants it for himself, which is exactly what Babylon is always trying to do. Claim God's position, God's kingdom for itself. Are we going to cave to that? Or are we going to kick their emissaries down a well? First Corinthians 6.
Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, and he says, he's rebuking them here. He says, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Economy. Households. Right? The saints will judge Babylon. Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So, if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church or the ecclesia? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not, is it so that there is not one among you, one wise, if, let me start again. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will not be able to decide between his brethren? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. What are they doing? They're letting Babylon in to determine how God's household should be run. So yes, he says that to their shame. Verse 7, actually then it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your own brethren. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. I.e., you used to be Babylonians. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You have been called out of Babylon and you have been placed in the heavenly economy of the kingdom of God. Why go back? And looking back at my message yesterday, this is exactly what the Israelites wanted to do in 1 Samuel 8. When they screamed for another king, they wanted a different economy. They wanted a different kurias. They wanted a different system. Elijah was challenging that system when he stood there on Carmel. He was challenging the strange outsider. He wanted to kick Baal down a well. He was standing up for the heavenly economy. He was tired of the ambassadors of the Phoenicians and the Tyrians and the Canaanites coming in and telling the Israelites to do things differently. He was sick and tired of Jezebel. He was sick and tired of Ahab because they were emissaries of a different kingdom. 2 Corinthians 5.20. We need to take this verse to heart. In the first century... The apostles and the early Christians took this job very seriously. He's, Paul says, therefore, we are what for Christ? Ambassadors. Ambassadors. To what? To another kingdom. While Babylon's trying to come into Christ's kingdom, sends their ambassadors. And we welcome them with open arms. What are we doing? Are we going to Babylon? Are we ambassadors of a king representing our kingdom to that kingdom, to the members of that kingdom, trying to draw them out? We've been failing. This is why the Roman government wouldn't put up with it. They knew what Christianity was about. That's why they persecuted them, threw them to the lions, jailed them, tortured them, and did all sorts of horrible things. And that's also why they did it again during the papal era. The reformers, the first century Christians, were all doing the same thing. They were acting as ambassadors for Christ. They far exceeded us in this task. Our king, our Baal, our Moloch, our kurias, is Jesus Christ. We have to start acting like it. We have to treat him like that. And we cannot expand the kingdom as he desires us to do unless we're living in accordance with his house rules, his economy. So, I'm going to ask you a really simple question. How's kingdom expansion been going lately? Not real well. 
It's been stagnating. How's Babylon been doing lately, though? But I'm smelling something. I think a lot of us are smelling something on the horizon. She's starting to smoke. She's starting to crumble. Chinks are showing in her armor. What are we going to do about that? That's an opportunity, people. That's an opportunity for us to act. The opportunity has always been there, but now we're starting to see Babylon weaken every year. Just as one example, the economy. The national debt is cranking up so fast you can't follow it. And that is a symptom of every single empire that has collapsed throughout history. That's just one. It's an opportunity, and we need to act. How do we do it? How do we do it? And as I said, this is something we can all do starting today. Who's excited about that? Nature abhors a vacuum. When Babylon falls, what are we going to do? Well, I'd like to read to you a letter that Julian II, the last pagan emperor of Rome, wrote to his high priest in Galatia. See, Julian II, he had this problem. This Christianity thing was really getting out of hand. And he had to get his people back to worshiping the, the Hellenic gods, you know, you know, Jupiter and all the rest of these guys. These, these, these were our forefathers' gods. Our people are just, this Christianity thing has got to stop. And he wrote to the high priest of Galatia. Here's what he said. He said, The Hellenic religion does not yet prosper as I desire, and it is the fault of those who profess it. For the worship of the gods is on a splendid and magnificent scale, surpassing every prayer and every hope. Why then do we think that this is enough? Why do we not observe that it is their benevolence to strangers, speaking of the Christians, for their care of the graves of the dead and the pretended holiness of their lives that have done most to increase atheism. Atheism is what the pagan Romans called Christianity because they didn't recognize the emperor as God. I believe that we ought really and truly to practice every one of these virtues. He's talking about the Christian virtues of generosity and giving. He said, in every city establish frequent hostels in order that strangers may profit by their benevolence. I do not mean for our own people only, but for others also who are in need of money. But I, I have but now made a plan by which you may be well provided for this. For I have given directions that 30,000 modii of corn shall be assigned every year to the whole of Galatia and 60,000 pints of wine. I order that one-fifth of this be used for the poor who serve the priests and the remainder to be distributed by us to strangers and beggars. For it is disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Galileans support not only their own poor but ours as well, all men see that our people lack aid from us. Teach those of the Hellenic faith to contribute to public service of this sort, and the Hellenic villages to offer their first fruits to the gods, and accustom those who love the Hellenic religion to these good works by teaching them that this was our practice of old. Then let us not, by allowing others to outdo us in good works, disgrace by such remissness, or rather utterly abandon the reverence due to the gods. What was his problem? Christians were helping each other. They were helping the poor. It was common practice in the pagan Greek and Roman era. If there was a plague, everybody packed up and got out of town. But then they noticed the Christians were staying back and taking care of the sick. That was a problem because a lot of times these sick people recovered and became Christians. The poor were becoming Christians. People were gathering to the cross because they saw that there was hope here. There was provision here. There was protection here. And the Christians, as the ambassadors of Christ, were demonstrating that on a daily basis. Julian II tried to counter that. But as we read yesterday from Bastia's The Law, the government has to take from somebody else to give it. So Julian II was trying to counter Christianity with socialism. That, obviously, as we know from history, doesn't work. See, today people will go to the churches, right? Oh, man, you know, the bank's going to foreclose on my house. Or, oh, you know, we're, we're sick and, you know, there's this problem and that problem. And what do most of the people in the churches do? Oh, there's a government program for that. Oh, there, call my insurance agent. Oh, my bank has great interest rates. Go talk to them. 
They're literally sending people back to Babylon because they are, in fact, Babylonian, right? They are ambassadors of Babylon. If they're seeking first the kingdom of God, would they be doing that? No. Deuteronomy 15. I've got to move along. Starting in verse 7. If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns, in, in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand from the poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him, and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need and whatever he lacks. Beware that there is no base thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of remission, is near, and your eye is hostile toward your poor brother, and you give him nothing. Then he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin in you. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. How blessed have we been as Christians in America? Babylon has been steamrolling us, folks. Now, with this in mind, let's take a look at Acts 2. What was the first thing Christians did upon receiving the gospel? Acts 2, this is a chapter where Peter first preaches the gospel after the ascension of Christ. Thousands are baptized. Verse 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And, all those, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Obviously, they weren't neglecting their families. But they sold of anything excess that they had so that they could contribute to the poor and the needy and those who had need of what they had. This isn't communism. This is what I like to call communism. What's mine is yours. If you have a need, you got it. I'll find a way to get it to you. Acts 4, 32 through 37. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For, now think of what Julian II wrote, for there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as they had need. In other words from each according to his ability to everyone according to his need. Not communism, though. This is volunteerism. Communism. Where people gave willingly and cheerfully and voluntarily for the cause of Christ to build the kingdom. They didn't care about their material possessions. They didn't care about what they had. They made their choice between God and mammon, and they chose God. You know, we're encouraged to be industrious, right? Proverbs says, look to the ant. And we are to provide for our own. So obviously we don't want our, our own family to go without. But generosity is the lifeblood of the kingdom of heaven. We're not to serve mammon. We're not to take thought for tomorrow, as Jesus Christ said in the Beatitudes. And I have learned this on a personal level. I've been blessed in that people have done things for me. And I have not only seen my own troubles being erased, but also seen them being elevated by the generosity of God. Ephesians 2. Man, it's sneaking up on me. Pages are sticking today. 
That's a Wisconsin Bible. I can't handle the stuff down here. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Yes, provide for your family, but what does Paul also say? Labor so that you have something to share if you run across someone in need. You know, there's a story that goes around my wife's family. Her grandmother had, at the time of the Depression, had five children. Her husband was in jail, and a, they, they were scraping to make ends meet. And a hobo showed up at the door, asked for some food. This woman, who had five children to feed, with no husband to support her, invited him in, sat him at the table, and fed him. And when he was done eating, he went to the door. As he was leaving, he turned and looked to her and said, Because you've done this, you will never go hungry. And he left. And did you know they never went hungry? She was a hardworking woman. She was industrious, but she wasn't afraid to give of what she had, and she survived the Great Depression. And by the way, she ended up with ten children in the end. My father-in-law was the tenth. You see, the kingdom is grown through voluntary generosity with gifts, giving of ourselves, our time, our resources. We need to put our pride aside, be humble enough to accept those gifts as well, right? Because without somebody to give to, you can't give, right? The give and take are both essential to the kingdom. And I get it. It's humiliating to have a need and go to a brother and say, brother, I've got a need. I get it. Because we've been raised to be these rugged individualists. It's, 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 it's shameful to say that I have a need. We've got to put that aside. What is pride? How, how often does God condemn pride? I've learned some hard lessons with that recently. You know, it may be more blessed than to receive, but both are blessed. I've been on both ends of that spectrum because both are important to kingdom growth. 1 Peter 4, 7-11 says, Be hospitable and minister... Or be a servant. That word minister, diakoneo, that's where we get the word deacon. If someone has a need, we need to do our best to fill it. If someone has a debt, if someone has a medical issue, if someone suffers material loss, let's try to help. That's agape. That's what the law hangs upon, loving God and neighbor. And when we love one, we love the other. John says if we claim to love God but hate our brother... We're a liar. This is community. Building community. We talk about community all the time, but without community, or without economy, you can't have community. Right? We need to start doing that. If we want community, that's great. But let's start the economy thing. That's what the Christians did. Like I said, Babylon's about to bite the dust. Christians need to help each other sever reliance on Babylon so we don't get pulled down with the sinking ship. Amen? And this is something we can all start doing today. We can commit to doing that, helping each other, helping our neighbor, helping a stranger, whoever's in need, because no matter who we're helping, we are building the kingdom. Cassius Dio's Roman history wrote about... Uh, Rome dealing with Greek pirates around 67 B.C. And here's what he said. And though some plundered here and some there, since of course it was not possible for the same persons to do harm throughout the whole length of the sea at once, they nevertheless showed such friendship, in the Greek he used the word philia, phileo, brotherly love, for one another, as to send money and assistance even to those entirely unknown, as if to their nearest of kin. In fact, this was one of the chief sources of their strength. Mark that. This was one of the chief sources of their strength, that those who paid court to any of them were honored by all, and those who came into collision with any of them were despoiled by all. To such an extent did the power of the pirates grow that their hostility became a grave and constant menace, admitting of no precaution and knowing no truce. They weren't interested in the emissaries of Rome. They hated Rome, but they, su they, they supported each other. And isn't that what we read of the various churches throughout Europe and Asia Minor doing in the days of the apostles? They were supporting each other with goods and funds. Paul talked about that a lot. 
In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, go there real quick. Paul is talking about supporting each other. And you'll notice some wording that's very similar to the tithe. People say, oh, the tithe isn't mentioned in the New Testament. Yeah, well, let's take a look at this. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of the participation of the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. This is free will offerings and tithes that they did according to their ability. I think, I think in King James it says, as they increased. That's tithe talk. Again, communism. Not communism. But as a result, the ecclesia of God grew and became a force that Rome had to reckon with. We are the temple of the living God. You think of the widow and her mites. See, it doesn't matter whether you throw in two pennies or two hundred. God can use that. That widow gave more than the Pharisees who were giving for show because she gave of everything that she had. And God sees us the same way. The tithe was not just intended for the priests, but also for the poor and the needy. It's the same thing today. Whenever you give to the temple of the living God and serving others, it's given to the cause of the kingdom itself. Christ said, as much as you've done to these, you've done to me. Robert Kiyosaki, a Japanese gentleman, he, he wrote uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. How many are familiar with that? Okay. I was listening to a podcast a while back with someone I was driving with, and he's, he, he's, he's, he's a heathen, right? He said, you know, it's a weird thing. He said, Once I started giving 10% of everything that I earned to charity, my, my, my earnings went up. My, I, I, I increased. He said, I don't, I don't know how it works. I don't know why. It's like a force of nature. But I recommend you try doing that. Well, gee whiz, I wonder why. <laughs> I gotta wrap this up, not wrap this up here, but folks, I'm, I, I gotta cut this short. But folks, I gotta tell you something. We might all have different gifts. We might have different, different doctrinal understandings, but we need to stand together in our understanding of what the kingdom of God needs in order to grow. And we can work together toward that. Folks, we need to be willing to give of ourselves. And we also need to be willing to come to each other with our needs. Because every time we go to Babylon to supply our needs, we are feeding the beast. And we are defecting to the other side. We need to keep our resources here. We need to be our own insurance. We need to help each other. We need to look to Christ as our insurance. We need to look to our God as our source for the things that we need in order to buy a home or build a business or buy a vehicle if we need it. And I'm not talking about frivolous stuff. I'm talking about the needs of life. Christ says, if you serve me, if you seek first the kingdom of heaven, I will take care of you. It's a promise. Do we believe that? Let's go. Get out of Babylon with the loans and, the, and all the rest of that nonsense. And if a brother does have a need, if a brother needs something, if he's trying so hard to start a business or recover something that he's lost, let's all chip in. Because there are blessings on both sides of that. And we can start that today. So here's my challenge to all of you. Let's find someone who has a need. When we go home, when we're sitting in the vehicles together, let's discuss somebody that we can help. Either in the body or without. Somebody we can help who has a need. A loss. A debt. Any kind of need that we can fill. And let's commit to helping that person and then moving on to another person. Maybe, maybe even recruiting that person that we've helped contribute to the next guy. And on and on and build exponentially. Folks, there's a reason why our enemies have been able to take over our schools and our entertainment because they were able to do that for each other. They understand how it works. Why can't we do that for the kingdom? 
So let's do that. Christ, God says, test me now in this when it comes to giving. In Malachi 3. Well, folks, let's test him. It's the one thing he says, test me. Try me out. Let's do it. We're all struggling to one extent or another. But folks, Babylon's going down. One, one day soon, one day later, it doesn't matter. But it's going down. We got to let go. Come out of her, my people, in whatever way we can. And we can help each other do that today. God guarantees he'll bless that. And we've seen it play out in history, not only with our own people, but with the heathen and the pagans in the past. So let's do that. Let's commit to that. I'm going to leave you with that thought. And I think that is my time. How about that? <laughs> Let's all give a round of applause to the, uh, all the three speakers that we had speak this weekend. If, for those that don't know, Paul drove from Wisconsin. How many hours? Too many. And then Kevin, of course, he flew here, but he spent a whole day in the Phoenix airport. Uh, I think, what, 16 hours? Yeah, sleeping there. We had to disinfect him before we let him back in here. But uh, Jason and I had it easy. We had a little bit, uh, I had a six hour drive. He had a, what, four? That's right, next conference is in Wisconsin. <laughs> anyway, I just want to thank everybody that. Uh, made this possible. Uh, those that uh, help financially pay for everything and those that just help put it on to begin with and those that extended prayers for it. Um, just everything. Uh, I want to thank my wife as well for helping and doing everything that she has because like I said last night it would not have been possible to have this it wouldn't have been for her. Um, This kind of concludes the conference, minus the prayers we're going to have in the next room. If y'all don't mind picking up your trash uh, at the table, uh, they said leave the tables and the chairs the way they are, and uh, we're going to uh, box up the few things that we have sitting out, and uh, if anyone has any questions, just let me know. Yes, sir? Uh, do we dispose of the communion cups or do you want to No, you can th throw them away. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you throw the communion cups away and any trash you see laying around. Um, I do, hey, Cassie, do we have any food back there? Okay, there is a little bit of food back there. I think some sandwiches and stuff. If anyone wants them, take them on the road or whatever, they're welcome to them. And yogurt and, uh, say what? Yeah, so in uh, water, if anyone wants to take some bottled water with them on the, their trip. So I want to just thank everybody for coming. I appreciate everybody that took the time to come. And I hope that uh, when we do this again, Lord willing, that uh, you can invite some more people and we can keep this growing and uh, kind of focus on young families and just keep uh, have the ball rolling. Yes, sir. I would just like to also uh, ask everyone to uh, praise God for and ask God to bless folks who made all this possible. There are a lot of people who contributed to this financially and materially. Uh, so, yeah, God bless them. Let's give them all. Before we leave, let's have a prayer for safe travels for everybody here, um, no matter how far you're driving. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this weekend. We thank you for this time that we were able to gather together in fellowship in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. We just praise you and we thank you, Lord, for this blessed weekend, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to extend safe travels to everyone in this room. Anyone's traveling, Lord, just be with them, Lord. Watch over and protect them and get them home safely without event. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and we just we thank you for all things. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you.